Hey guys, and Shine, and welcome to the I Give a Damn podcast, brought to you by Floracy Media, the same company behind ODs on Facebook. Today's guest is Dr. Francis Bynum, who will share some insights into rural practice optometry with her private practice experience living in rural Tennessee, where she gets to share how challenges are truly just opportunities, and rural practice may be, in fact, the best kept secret. In optometry. So without further ado, please hit those like, subscribe, and follow buttons. And here we go with Dr. Francis Bynum. Welcome, Dr. Francis Bynum. Tell us about who you are and what you do. Well, I practice in Northwest Tennessee in a small town, Martin, Tennessee. It's rural. I, I love what I do. I'm passionate about what I do. And it's just exciting to be a part of a great profession. It's enabled me to go lots of places, meet lots of people. And at the end of the day, I just love taking care of folks every day. And I know with the rural uh, practice, can you tell us kind of like your journey? Like how did you, how did you find yourself practicing in a rural town? Is that something that you, you grew up there and you returned or did you... Do you have a different story? Can you tell us that? Well, I did not grow up there. I actually grew up in rural Florida. Florida is rural. There are places that are rural (laughs) in Florida. So I grew up in the panhandle of Florida, which is pretty rural. It's not as rural as it used to be. So my journey after college was going to optometry school in Memphis, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. I knew after that that I wanted to go back to those kind of roots, those rural roots. But not going back to Florida... Tennessee was, a, I thought, a great place to practice, so that's how I made my journey to Martin and just put my roots down there, and I've been in private practice for over 25 years there. Mm-hmm. My husband is from there. I met oh. him after I moved there, but my husband is from there, so obviously the roots are pretty deep there. So did you finish optometry school and just know I'm, I'm going to find some small town. Did you, was it random? Did you look things up or did you, have you been there before? And you're just like, I, I like this place. I'd actually never been there before. And I went to work for somebody for a few years before I opened my own practice. And that's how I got there. He was looking for someone and I thought it would be a good fit for a small town. And, and I loved it. What was, what was it about rural practice? and rural living that called to you? Well, I'm not a big city girl. I don't want to sit in traffic. Mm -hmm. I don't need all those modern conveniences of the city because you can travel there. But I suppose uh, wide open spaces a little bit. I live on a farm, so I don't actually even live in the town. I live out on a farm. Mm -hmm. So I like uh, just like wide open spaces. With uh, living on the farm, is do you do you have farm animals? Do you, your cows? Cows. Okay. My husband raises cows. Like dairy for beef. Beef. Okay. That's a that's something that I think even at a young age myself, uh, I got to go on like a field trip and go to like a farm in like kindergarten, and I knew right away I'm like, this is not for me. <laughs> <laughs> right. The smell of nature. Um, it, it's it's a lot. <laughs> There's a lot going on. It's hard work. Mm -hmm. It's not easy work. So I like to say, you know, when I'm not at the office, not doing the optometry thing, I'm a pretty good farmhand. And the thing is, I'm free labor, right? (laughs) So, um, but yeah, I'm a pretty good farmhand too. So I um, learned a lot living on a farm Mm -hmm. uh, from driving tractors to mending fences. So you grew up on a farm too? No, I did not. I I never knew farm life until I met my husband. So so I've learned a lot. You've learned a lot and you love it. You you enjoy it? Absolutely. That's awesome. I can't imagine living anywhere else. I I just can't imagine that. Well, I'm happy that you found a place that you you truly love to live and work. Uh, With work, with optometry, what do you think is challenging for a rural optometrist? What's something different about that maybe optometrist practicing in a rural area would experience different from a doctor working in an urban area? 
you're going to use the word challenge. I'll use the word opportunity. Okay. So, I love that. What, uh, what opportunities? Well, I think there's a lot of opportunities. I think practicing rural, it's the way you make connections with your patients mm-hmm. is a bit differently. I think as a rural optometrist, there are opportunities, but you have to find those opportunities. So if I wanted to send a patient to a specialist, That's not just up the street. That might be potentially three hours one way. So if you had a corneal problem and we were going to send you to a corneal specialist, it's either a three-hour one way to Nashville or maybe two and a half hours to Memphis. I think you have to realize that that then becomes a six-hour round trip. Yeah. you got to ask someone to carry you. Then this becomes a day-long adventure maybe a day and a half adventure. So I think one of the opportunities that rural optometry has allowed me to do, and many of my other colleagues, is to get really good at a lot of things. Mm -hmm. So to keep that patient in our office so we can help them be good at cornea things, be good at anterior seg stuff, posterior seg stuff. It's just enabled us to take that opportunity to be good at a lot of things. And we're not good at everything. We're not perfect at everything. And I think that's where this idea of referring to other optometrists, maybe in this radius of, that could help us. So if the optometrist down the street was really good with pediatrics, mm-hmm. and I'm not, maybe I refer my pediatric patients for myopia management to that individual. So, but I think in a rural area, those opportunities are there mm-hmm. to see a wide variety of things. And it enables us to just get better at those things. For sure. So your approach to comprehensive care, over the years, you've had to adapt and learn and l- learn how to see and manage just about everything. Absolutely, and te- technology is changing at a very fast pace. Mm-hmm. That is, too, there's this opportunity to bring technology into your practice. Obviously, that could be a challenge from a monetary standpoint to have mm-hmm. a lot of technology. I think about technology that wasn't available, and I'm going to date myself a bit, but you know, wide field photography wasn't out there when I got out of school. OCT technology wasn't there. So obviously I've had to learn all of those things, which is just opportunity. It's opportunity to get better Mm -hmm. at our craft. It's opportunity to diagnose, manage, treat more things. It's just given us that opportunity and enabled patients in our community to stay locally versus having to make those trips. I know you said the word opportunity, right, several times. Clearly that's a, a mindset sort of thing you you must have adapted um especially with you run your own practice absolutely so Mm -hmm. that's that's a mindset shift that i I hope other listeners and people kind of pick that up that you can't just think of it oh this is so difficult no this is an opportunity right right around every corner there's challenges Mm -hmm. for every patient we see there's a challenge but what if you took that spin and said well with every challenge i'm just going to make that an opportunity What's, uh, can you give us an example of a time maybe earlier in, in your career where you were faced with a, a difficulty or an opportunity and you were able to maybe turn it around and help grow your practice or help your patient? Yeah, think about when OCT technology came around. Mm-hmm. So I kind of felt like I was a little bit of an early adapter. And in all honesty, this comes with the support of your friends and colleagues, too. So you're talking about this technology that's come along, OCT technology. I'm with some colleagues, four or five colleagues, and we're all talking about purchasing this. We're all practicing in rural America. Mm -hmm. So we all decide to purchase OCT technology for our practices. And we begin to realize all the things now we can see in the retina I'm not saying we missed those things. Well, maybe we overlooked them. (laughs) But it's just enabled us to see things differently. 
And then we began to, where we might have sent these people to retina before. So it gave us an opportunity to, from a taking care of patients. So now we can see that epiretinal membrane better. Maybe now we realize it's central serous coronopathy and not something else. Maybe we realize that it's maybe better in managing glaucoma. Mm-hmm. So that's one aspect of OCT technology from the standpoint it allowed us to diagnose, manage things a bit better within our own practices. But I think if you expand that a little bit, look at the business opportunity. You know, when I first bought an OCT, the reimbursement was probably at least twice what it is now. So there was a business opportunity as well Mm -hmm. from one, I could bill for this piece of equipment for doing that test, but also maybe more office visits for that particular individual in my office. So that from a business standpoint, it gave opportunity. And then I think if you expand it even further is now you, you have this opportunity. I see something in my practice with this OCT technology. What if I can snap a picture of that and just send it to retina and say, Hey, is this, is this something emergency? Is this urgent or is it okay to go ahead and schedule Ms. Jones next week? So I think those types of technology, that's just one example mm-hmm. of how it's enabled us to really practice better. And I think for me, something that came to my mind was it wasn't just enabled you to be a better doctor, but allowed you to better serve your patients, right? Because if they have an early stage of AMD, but you're kind of questioning it, you do an OCT and you're like, oh no, this is okay. We can watch this. I don't need to send you for that full day off of work with your, your you know husband driving you for three hours to get to the retina specialist and then drive back. That's You've saved them that day, that stress, and you can manage that. So I think that's that's the way I'm like, you're serving not just your patients with that, you're helping yourself. Um, it, it just it rises everything. So I love that. Right, you mentioned um, macular degeneration, something that's extremely prevalent. Um, you know, nationwide is prevalent, but it's very prevalent where I live as well. I think it also, that technology lets a patient see that. You know, I can tell you you have something going on, but if you are still seeing well, maybe you don't understand what's going to be down the road. Yeah. So that that visual seeing something is very useful too. Right. It's You feel the gravity of it a little bit more. And then being able to compare that. So here you are in January of last year. Now there you were in June, in December, you know, this progression and being able to take those photographs mm-hmm. and show that to a patient. Being that you said uh, AMD, you have a lot of patients with macular degeneration. Uh, is that something that just your area, the demographic, is the is? Do you believe rural areas maybe just have older populations, aging population, or is there, is it is it just your clinic maybe? Well, no. When you live in the South, where lard is its own food group, then <laughs> <laughs> that might lend for a few diseases that you see, you know, diabetes, macular degeneration. Do you think you also see more? like extreme versions of that? Do people maybe who are diabetic in a rural area have a harder time with management? Tough to say. That's a challenge, is a challenge to sometimes educate people about why they should manage whatever disease we're following. Mm -hmm. It can be a challenge. Um, And it's our job to educate these folks. Now, whether they choose to go that path, that's another you know, uh, that's just another path that they might take. But if we can give them the tools, we can educate them, but then they have to do it themselves. Right. Um, but yes, rural America, we see um, our clinics are full of diabetes, macular degeneration, uh, glaucoma. Our, our nation is not getting healthier, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. So I think this is something that all clinics see. With... Uh like when we're talking rural 
like rural optometry practicing in a rural area what kind of like population like where where you practice what's the population there so Martin's a town of about 12,000. Okay. We have a college there, so that kind of adds. So we have about 6,000 students that attend UT Martin. But then you look at beyond that. So I mentioned I don't, I don't actually live in the, the city of Martin. I live outside of the city limits. So then you expand that to the entire county of Weekly County is the county that I live in. So, you know, we draw patients from not only Weekly County, but surrounding counties and then to the north is Kentucky so I draw people from that as well so this one town we we draw a lot of patients yeah. from from those areas and so some patients may be driving 20 30 minutes hour maybe I mean maybe. not quite an hour but maybe 30 minutes yeah that's pretty reasonable yeah I know that's just a thought that comes to my mind because I guess when I was in um like when I was in optometry school and I'm thinking, okay, what's rural optometry? I'm thinking, oh, I'm living in a town of like 2,000 people, right? It could be that. could yes. be that. It could be that. Uh, in some places in Minnesota, my, my stepmother, she lives in a town of about 2,000 and there's an optometrist there. And I'm like, that's awesome. But I know even in our practice and in our area, there's probably about 100,000 people. But we still get a lot of people who have farmland that's maybe 40 minutes away and they will drive into town to come see for an eye exam so it's you know it can definitely still pull and draw a lot of people outside of that town you know from you know if you had to i mean we're here in atlanta today and mm -hmm. if you had to drive 30 minutes that that might not even be across town here in atlanta <laughs> so 30 minutes rural is uh no red lights no stop signs probably so right. yeah it's a different kind of driving 30 minutes you mentioned uh, the importance of like OD, OD referrals. Um, can you talk more about just how you manage with um, both ODs as well as referring for like emergency care? So the first question I was would ask, why don't we do more of this? Why do we not find this need to refer within our profession mm -hmm. more? There's a lot of specialty things out there in optometry. So it might be myopia management. It might be fitting scleral lenses. It might be you do something unique. Maybe you do lasers, uh, SLTs, YAGs, PIs. Maybe you do those things. Maybe you do injections. Maybe you remove lumps and bumps. So we all can find things that we don't do in our practices. So we could look at colleagues around us and say, you know, my colleague down the street, she likes to see kids. As a matter of fact, that's all she sees is kids. <laughs> so if you have that child that has a need for something, maybe vision therapy, why don't not, why aren't you thinking in terms of referring that to that colleague? Or perhaps a situation where some of our colleagues don't inject, so I'm you know, practice in a state where injections are allowed. So if you didn't do that, why not just send something that needed a simple injection just over to your colleague for that? Mm -hmm. Or if it was specialty fit contacts, like sclerals, things like that, maybe you don't want to dabble in that, but maybe you have a colleague that does. I think about NeuroLens. NeuroLens is something I don't do, but I have colleagues just to the west of me that do that and i have a colleague in my own town that does that and i've mentioned that to a patient that maybe this would be a good idea for you based on the symptoms that you have so i think it's us being able to um uh, let our egos go by the wayside a bit and say what can we do for the best for our patients mm -hmm. And that might be sending a patient to a colleague that can really better take care of them. Or perhaps, you know, it works both ways. A colleague sends a patient to you so you could take good care of them. So it's about, at the end of the day, it's about making our profession the best it can be and taking care of our patients to the best of our ability. And that ability might be knowing that you practice just up the street from me and you could fit this child in my OP management or something. Yeah, that's definitely something 
I, I thankfully feel like it's happening more, but I feel like, like you said, it's something that's kind of early, something that our industry has struggled with. And maybe it's because they don't know where to start. I think we, we've mm-hmm. all been there like, you know, I want to do this thing, but I don't know how to get started. I don't know, and maybe you talk to a colleague and they say, hey, that's a great idea, but how are you going to do that? So I think it starts as a grassroots effort for all of optometry to realize there's a need. Mm -hmm. And once you realize that need, then you say, well, what can we do to make that come to fruition? What can we do? I think you reach out to like-minded colleagues that think like you do, that think this is something that would be good for our profession. And then you just start this movement. Right. So you're right. I, I think we don't we don't do enough of this. But how could we develop plans? I think one of the other potential something that I noticed with a patient of mine was he came to me because he found one of my YouTube videos on keratoconus. So he drove almost an hour to come see me, and I told him like, well, I can fit you in a scleral lens. But you're pretty advanced with, he he was a pretty advanced cone. And so I told him, you know, you're pretty advanced. I could do it, but it's going to take me multiple tries. And I'm happy to work with you. But we have a scleral specialist who is one of the top in the world, in my opinion. And he's going to do a much better job on that. So how about we schedule you with him? And then once they're all set, then I'm happy to see you back for your routine care. We can manage it from there. And I believe his trust in me, my relationship with him just was like amplified by 5,000. Because I was able to admit, like, I kind of know what I'm doing, but the best care you're going to get from this other this other professional. And that ended up just amplifying, I think, the team. Like, we're here to really help that patient. Have you had similar experiences? I think at the end of the day, the patients, they they trust you because you were honest with them Mm -hmm. and they respect you because of that. So I've had that situation with, so I mentioned I don't do pediatrics. I don't do vision therapy. Mm -hmm. So I've seen children that have that need. They could certainly benefit from that. Sending that to a colleague, those patients, I still see their families, but I remember one little boy that was having, he was really struggling. Uh, school was uh, school was a struggle for him. Reading was a struggle for him. And I really felt that this child could really benefit from vision therapy. I talked to the mom and dad about vision therapy, and I said, I don't really do this. I know about it, but it's just not in my wheelhouse. That's mm-hmm. not what I'm really good at. So I think that there's a doctor that is this is all she does, and you could really benefit that. This child could really benefit from that. He was also a contact lens wearer, so this child went, I'm not sure how much VT they did, but I do recall that as the mom or dad came in for their regular visit, they appreciated the fact that I sent their child to someone and he improved his reading skills, and he's done fine in life now. He's uh, <laughs> out of college. He's, uh, but you think at the end of the day, you did what was best for that patient, even if it was something you couldn't take care of, and you knew someone was better at it than you. So I think, you know, in small towns, word of mouth is huge. And I hope that these people would say, you know what, we go see Dr. Bynum and she's great and wonderful because there was something she couldn't help us with, but she sent us to the best person out there. Yeah. So I think that's really what you want your patients, that trust, that communication that you build with mm-hmm. in those relationships. I think that's really important. And it'll echo years, right? It'll, it'll echo through their family and everybody and your reputation will, will grow because of that. Absolutely, yeah. I want to step back because earlier when we were talking about OCTs, you mentioned like bringing that on financially. I think for any clinic, making a big purchase is is a challenge. But when it comes to practicing in a rural area, I know there's kind of a question I have is that the idea is that in a lot of rural communities, there maybe isn't, they're usually not the wealthiest communities, perhaps. But I've also heard that practicing 
in a rural area can be quite financially rewarding. Can you speak on that at all and kind of share your thoughts and insights? I do. I mean, I I don't want to say it's the best kept secret because then everyone's going to want to move to rural areas, (laughs) right? But I think I look at some of my colleagues that truly have done it better than me, that they have built practices in rural areas. Just amazing. I mean, I've never really peeked into their financials, but I know that they have done an amazing job from a business standpoint Mm -hmm. of building practices and being just wildly successful, not only as doctors, but business people as well. So I think there's a huge opportunity. You know, I think of just my cost of living. So we just take the state of Tennessee. My cost of living is probably half of what it would be for a colleague that lives in Nashville. So if you just look from that standpoint. Now, my cost of doing business, I mean, I still have to pay the same amount for, you know, a bottle of drops that, you know, those Nashville doctors. But I would bet that a lot of things that in my practice, my internet probably costs less. My electricity probably costs less. I mean, so the cost of doing business in a rural area from those types of things is probably less. Yeah, you've lowered your costs. And the building. So if you took my building and I put that in Nashville, Tennessee, I can't even imagine what what it would cost the difference. I, yeah, I don't know. Right. Yeah, Four or five times. Yeah, who knows? Rent, taxes. Yeah, all, all of those, those things. things, right. So I think you look at just from the logistics of those things from a business standpoint are a lot less mm-hmm. than big city. But equipment, obviously that's going to cost the same. I mean, those things are going to cost the same. But you um, you invest so people come to see you. And so I think it's a good win-win for for doctors that want to be, and I realize not everybody wants to be rural. I realize that. But I think from an investment standpoint, I think rural, and, rural optometry is a great investment. Yeah. What about uh, telehealth? What are your opinions on the telehealth opportunities that kind of are bubbling up? Because Now I'm going to use the word challenge. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> The reason I ask that is because uh, in telehealth has become a bigger thing in the last few years since 2020, and they it's frequently said that oh this is going to help for rural access. And there's there's some there's some mixed thoughts and feelings around that in the industry, and I'd love to hear what you what you think. I think telehealth has its place. I don't think it will ever dominate our industry because mm-hmm. telehealth can't really flip an eyelid. They can't dilate an eye. There's just a few things that it cannot do. So there was a hospital in a county, and I believe if I get this right, the county had no optometrist. So within that, the hospital put a lane of equipment in. So they did basically an eye exam, a remote eye exam. And they interviewed patients that went through this process. And the patients were like, this is the best eye exam I've ever had. Yeah, really? How could that be? How could that be the best eye exam? I questioned it too. But I think maybe it was the experience the patient had that it made them feel that way. Now you and I might say, well, how could how could they have really had that good of an experience? How could a camera, how could that? But again, that's perception, I suppose. But so knowing that that was a part of something of, of telehealth, um, kind of this, so you just think, how could you incorporate that into your own practices? I've struggled with that, to be honest with you, because it's very difficult. I mean, if you take a picture of your eye with your iPhone and you just have a maybe a subconjunctival hemorrhage, I mean, that's, yeah, that's pretty easy. But I can't really see that you have a corneal abrasion. I can't see. So I struggle with that a bit of how telehealth could be incorporated into into my practice. That I do find as a challenge. I've just never found that as a huge opportunity. Um, Maybe I talk about this OD to OD referral thing. Maybe there's some colleagues out there that have mastered this and made it successful. I don't know, but I'd like to hear about it. Right. I know myself, uh, I've shared some stories before of 
it's frustrations because I've had I've had a family doctor as my patient in the exam room and we had to dilate this patient when I come back to finish the rest of the the dilated fundus exam the doctor's sitting there on their phone and they're treating a patient for pink eye and I'm like in my head I'm like did you stain them how do you know it's not herpetic how do you know it's not uh, their IOP spiking up how do you know you know it's not a uveitis so there's a lot of those and then the question of you know standard of care are we actually doing a disservice so there's there comes to a lot of those sort of questions I think there's more questions than answers for for our specialty that might not be the case for other other specialties or primary care um, you know if you have itchy eyes and you reach out to your primary care. Well, it could be allergies. It could be Demodex. It, yeah, so, but statistically, you know, it's spring. Things are blooming. It's probably allergies. So I can, I get that. Yeah. Um, if it doesn't clear up, then go see your specialist. Is, is that not the kind of the way that works? But, so I don't know. I, I just... I just see all the challenges there. Mm -hmm. Um, I've not been able to put my positive, positive poly spin on opportunities there because I can't, I can't wrap my head around that. Um, And you're probably used to a standard of, of quality of care mm -hmm. that, you know, it's just not, not quite there. Cause it's not what you and I would do. Cause you and I know what we would do if someone had that complaint, my eyes itch. We're going to take a look at them under a slit lamp. We're probably going to avert their lid. We might stain to look to see. And you just cannot do that through telehealth. It's, I'm just unaware how you could do that. <laughs> what, um, beyond some of these, these things, what are, to, to maybe a student, to maybe a young doctor, even a doctor who is um, currently practicing in more of a rural area, if somebody was thinking about it and you had some tips, advice, uh, what, what would come to mind? What's some helpful, helpful tips for people who are thinking maybe they want to get into rural optometry? Find a mentor. Yeah? Yeah. Go find a mentor that has done rural optometry well and steal all the advice you can steal from <laughs> them. Because I think one thing about our profession, we're pretty open about discussing when people come to us and say, how can I do this? I think most of us are pretty willing to give some guidance. So that would be my biggest advice is find a mentor and it doesn't just have to be one. Right. How about finding a uh, where to practice? Well, you know, there's a lot of electronic things out there, like Google things out there that you could Google about uh, where there's a need. Yeah. I think uh, there's lots of um, uh, platforms out there, too, that people are looking for, uh, trying to attract people to Mm -hmm. rural optometry. It's tough. They can't get doctors to come to rural optometry. So I think there's a lot of opportunities with uh, groups out there that... uh, are looking for people. So if you if you're looking for that, I think you can find that easily. And that's true. I, I know in a lot of the social spaces for optometry, there's there's always people asking like, how do I hire a, a doc, a new associate to come work with me? And and they're out out in a rural practice. Uh, why do you think why do you think that is? Why do you think it's such a challenge? Could be a lot of challenges if you're, um, you know, if you if you have a family, I think you have to consider your family. You know, is your spouse going to want to move to rural America? Sure. That might not be the case. It's a great place to raise kids. Mm -hmm. But on the flip side, people say, well, I want my kid in this type of school system or I want my child to have this opportunity that might not be offered in rural America. If your child's a, you know, a competition swimmer, that's probably not the opportunity where I live for that. So I think it's sometimes it's not about you. It's about your family. So mm-hmm. if, you know, if you're married and with kids, you have to consider those things. But so I think that's one of the challenges. I think people have a misconception of rural America as well. 
thinking that they they can't uh, boom in practice. I mean, that's a huge misconception. So, um, but you got to work. It's hard work. <laughs> you have to work hard. And if you're going to come to rural America and practice, you have to work hard. So if you're not willing to work hard, don't come to rural America. I, th- I think you could say that about all optometry, right? You, you have to be <laughs> willing to work to make it. Um, I imagine being in a rural place, though, for a lot of doctors, they're, they may be the only eye doctor around for, for some time. And mm-hmm. so do you, I imagine, are you on call? Do you do emergency sort of things in the evenings or sure. there's those sort of times? Sure. Yeah. I get calls to, I mean, it's not every night, thank goodness. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, you have to go in to see a patient after hours. It's a, I mean, I, I think most of us do that. Not all of us do, but yeah. Um, but that's not just to, um, so where I live, it's not just about seeing patients in my clinic that are having problems. We happen to have a rehab hospital in Martin, Tennessee, mm. and sometimes I have to go see patients there too after hours. So, um, you know. So you I, also have hospital privileges and those sort of things? I do. Um, we have a, what you might think of as traditional hospital in Martin, so I have privileges there. And then we have a rehab hospital that um, I have privileges there as well. So That's those awesome. are the, you know, those patients typically are the ones that have maybe, um, you know, had a stroke or something like mm-hmm. that that might pertain to some visual field loss, things like that. So those are the type of patients I would see there. Did it take you a long time to promote your expertise in the area when you moved there? Well, it's about building relationships. And, you know, you have to be proactive to go out and educate because, Unfortunately, when people hear the word optometrist, they just think glasses and contacts. So it's our job to go re-educate them, let them know what we can do. So that, that takes effort. That doesn't just happen overnight. It's about making connections. When I first moved to Martin, I remember I had a patient that came in. She's still my patient today, by the way. <laughs> and, but she came in and uh, she had a swollen nerve. And it was my first swollen nerve in practice. So, you know, I was a little nervous, right? So, but, but I was trained well, so I knew what to do. She needed blood work. At the time, I did not have hospital privileges, so I had to call her primary care doctor. So I called him up, and I told him what I was seeing in this lady's eye, that she had optic neuritis, and that, uh, that she needed some blood work done. And I knew you know, what blood work I wanted done. And so Center for Blood Work ends up, she has um, optic neuritis due to cat scratch fever. Okay. So I remember the, uh, so I'd never met this primary care doctor because I was, you know, only a couple months into practicing. But I remember he came by the clinic to meet me. And because you know, we had ordered the blood work, we figured out. So kind of the backstory is he had been treating this patient for about three months. She would get a little bit of a fever and he'd put her on antibiotics and she'd get better. But that was the real reason. And so with the blood work, we figured out what was wrong with her (laughs) and treated her appropriately, got her on the correct antibiotics and, and fixed this lady's problem. But he came by to meet me. And in hindsight, I should have gone to meet him first but he came by and after that whenever i would have a patient that would have something it didn't have to be that unusual it wasn't optic neuritis but sometimes i would make a point to stop at the clinic and introduce myself to the local primary care people so it takes effort Mm -hmm. to do those things and usually it was by mutual patients that either i saw something or um so you just you've got to go out into the community and put yourself out there so most people are pretty receptive. That's, um, you know, making friends with the pharmacies, pharmacists there. Um, you know, one of the great things about in a small town, those people come and they work there forever. So it's not like the doctors change a lot. Mm-hmm. So, so you can build those relationships. 
I hope uh, people who are listening, especially any young docs or people who move into a new area are taking notes <laughs> because uh, I think that's, that's really a, a big deal. Um, I can't tell you, you know, I, I don't, I, at least eventually when I first started practicing, I practiced in a town of about 15,000 people, um, but it was still just outside of Minneapolis. And uh, I started a relationship with a family doctor, a, piece, uh, a primary care doctor who when we got to meet, uh, I asked him, like, hey, what can I do to make your job easier when it comes to our, our mutual patients? And he's like, you know, if you put him on a new medication, like for glaucoma or something, and thankfully he knew that I treated glaucoma, uh, he's like, just just let me know, because otherwise I, I may never know that they're on, like, a, a beta blocker for their eye drops. And so I started not just sending him notes about that, I started sending all the family doctors notes whenever I started a patient on glaucoma. Uh, and that started building relationships with everybody. And suddenly I started getting more referrals for, for diabetic eye exams and things like that. So it's, uh, it's a great practice builder. And yeah, I think just to your point, it's exactly it's right. really important. Communication. Mm -hmm. So um, from uh, other than rural optometry, uh, I'm curious, what else are you excited about for optometry going forward? I'm looking at just legislation across mm -hmm. the country. So in the last year, certainly there's been some kind of negative things with legislation um, about what had happened in Florida. I think perhaps you look at this too as opportunity that we go out and have this movement too to begin to, or to continue to educate legislatures um, about what we do. If you would have asked me this question a few years ago about how many states do you think would allow lasers, I would have said, you know, I just don't know. But now I think there's 15 states that now allow lasers. And I think that's growing in momentum. So that's one aspect I think is exciting about our profession, being able to add that to um to our wheelhouse of doing that. So, so those are kind of exciting times. I think um, just uh, all the, the specialties that are occurring in our profession, I think that's pretty exciting as well. Um, there are just lots of opportunities and sometimes you have to create those opportunities, but I think there's a lot of opportunities out there schools are producing more students but if you look at the need out there it's growing mm -hmm. if you look at ophthalmology that's not growing so i think there's there's a lot of opportunities out there that we as a profession need to recognize and take advantage of uh, i'm excited for the future i have a daughter-in-law that is um, in optometry school so that's exciting um, I have friends that their kids are in optometry school. That's exciting. Um, you know, you have to be excited for this next generation of optometrists. Um, they're a different breed now, I'll say. They're, they're just a different breed. They're, they, they have grown up with social media, and mm -hmm. they've grown up with a lot of things that, I mean, they've grown up with, like, OCT technology in Wideville. Yeah, that's, I mean, we didn't have that, so I'm kind of jealous. <laughs> but the the opportunities that the next generation of optometrists have is uh, it's wide open. It is truly wide open, and certainly people could talk about a lot of negative things in our profession, a lot of challenges in our profession. But I think if you turn that spin and say, look at all the optom all the opportunities that optometry has, I think it's a wonderful profession. And there are just tremendous amounts of, of opportunities out there for the next generation. Yeah. Well, my last and final question I've been asking our guests, and this is kind of, imagine waking up the next day and you were elected the kind of Surgeon General of Optometry. You know, you, you were elected, we want you to make decisions and make optometry eye care for the United States so much better. What would be the first thing on your agenda, whether it be for optometry, the profession, or for public health? What would be your, what do you think would be your big thing? Wow, that's a loaded question. 
I would suddenly have all this power and responsibility. <laughs> you know, I'm big on education. So I think the platform of education would be where I would start and make sure that first I could educate everybody about what optometry is. Because, you know, I mentioned that you use the word optometry. Most people just think glasses and contact lenses. So I think my first platform would be to go out and educate or re-educate people about what optometry is, what we do. But I would hope that the most, um, that the, what would come across from me is my passion that I have for optometry. I would hope that that would be, that would resonate with everybody, just the passion that I have for a wonderful profession and all that it's given me. I love that. Well, thank you again so much for being here, and I hope to maybe someday we'll, we'll have you back on again soon. Thanks so much. So that was our episode for today. Thank you so much for listening in. Hey, you know, I put a lot of effort into these episodes and I really want to continue bringing the most value to you and our listeners. So if you haven't done so already, please, if you're watching on YouTube, leave us a comment. Or if you're listening in on your favorite podcasting station, leave us a review over there. That'll really help us out. Thank you so much again for listening in and keep an eye on it. And we'll see you in that next episode.